So now it's 6 p.m. Pacific time. I think we can start and hope you guys like the music. So before we get started, I just want to do a quick introduction on AI Camp. So we are a global online platform for developers, engineers, and data scientists to learn and practice AI technology with the mission of make AI available to all developers. AI Camp have grown to over 70,000 tech engineers in the group, have hosted over 300 local tech meetups, workshops, boot camps, large tech conferences, and live stream most of the tech talks globally. We have local study groups in the major cities in the US, a few cities in Europe, India, China, Australia. You can take a look at the website to see our upcoming tech talks, workshops, and crash courses that we offer. So starting next week, let's see. So starting next week on March 5th and 7th, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Pacific time, we will have our online workshop on dimension reduction from modeling to visualization. So you will learn about the widely use of dimension reduction methods such as PCA, ICA, STNI, and UMAP. You will learn to explore them to reduce the dimension, uh, dimension of your data with Python. We will cover eight topics in four hours live talk, three hands-on collab. You will have real-time interaction with the instructors. And if you miss any of the section, you can watch the replay anytime you want. So we offer 30% discount until this Sunday. So please check out our website for details. I will put the link in the chat window. So going back to our main topic today, today we're excited to have David Gu, Associate Professor in Computer Science Department, also affiliate with Applied Mathematics Department in the State University of New York at Stony Brook. Dr. Gu is also affiliate professor in the Center of Math Mathematical Science and Application of Harvard University. So without further ado, let's welcome Professor Gu. Hi, Professor Gu, I can unshare my slides and then you can start to share your slides. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, um, so thank you for the invitation. Uh, so today I will um, report our recent research uh, with Professor Yao from Harvard University. So the title is Unoptimal Transportation View of Generative uh, Adversarial Networks. So um, <clears throat> this was actually uh, collaborated with a lot of professors, okay, and uh, medical data doctors, uh, including Professor uh, Zhong Xuanluo Nalei from uh, Dalian University, um, <clears throat> uh, Professor Dimitri Samaras, and so on. Okay, so here is the outline, okay, for today's talk. So first, I will introduce manifold distribution hypothesis. Then uh, um, I will explain um, manifold learning a little bit. Then I give an overview for optimal transportation. Then uh, I will analyze okay, the relation between generators and the discriminator, whether they should collaborate with each other or compete with each other. Then I will um, introduce regularity theory to the solutions for uh, motion pay equation which can be used to explain mode claps. And finally, I will introduce a novel framework, uh, autoencoder, automatic transport, and show some advantages for this framework. Okay. Uh, the first part on um, Ms. Manifold Distribution Hypothesis. So this explains the, the deep reason why deep learning really works. So we know that um, deep learning is the mainstream technique for many machine learning tasks and uh, deep learning is really successful. But uh, theoretical understanding of deep learning uh, remains very primitive. So we believe that um, the great success of deep learning can be explained by the well-accepted manifold distribution hypothesis and the clustering distribution assumption. So the meaning for manifold distribution is that, so uh, natural high dimensional data actually concentrates close to a nonlinear low-dimensional manifold. So in the ambient space, 
okay, uh, we are interested in some natural data site, like human facial photos. Then uh, such kind of class of data actually can be treated as a probability distribution. The support for this distribution is very close to a low dimension of manifold. Then clustering distribution, basically, uh, the distance among probability distributions for subclasses on the manifold actually are far enough to uh, recognize them. Then uh, basically, deep learning method can learn and represent the manifold structure and also can transform the probability distributions. So that's the uh, foundation for, for deep learning techniques. So here we show a very simple example. We consider MNIST data site. And uh, uh, each image actually is a 10 8 by 10 8 small image. We treat it as one point. So then basically, um, the image space basically is a Euclidean space with a 10 8 by 10 8 dimension is extremely high. Then using um, manifold embedding te techniques like TSNE, we can embed the handwritten digit digits okay, uh, to 2D plane as shown on the, on the right hand side. So each point representing one image, then a different color indicating different classes. Okay, now we can see there are 10 classes for, for, for the MNIS data set. Okay, so this shows that okay, the image space is really high dimension, um, but for MNIS data set, the manifold actually is really low dimension. We can use only two dimension to visualize okay, uh, most of the data, those data points for the data set. So this gives you a real example for manifold structure for special data sites. So here we can see um, the mathematical definition. Um, so we use Rn to represent the ambient space, like the image space. And, uh, in this space, we have a low dimensional manifold, sigma. Okay, The manifold is nonlinear, is curved, or the topology might be complicated. Okay. <clears throat> Then uh, this manifold actually is the support for data distribution. Okay. <clears throat> then we map the manifold to the parameter domain, or we call latent space or feature space. So the dimension of feature space equal to the dimension of the manifold, which is a really low dimension. Okay. Then uh, the mapping from manifold to the latent space is called encoding mapping. Okay. And the reverse mapping from feature space to the manifold is called decoding mapping. But but uh, the encoding mapping is not unique. Uh, we can transform from one local representation to another one. So this mapping actually 5G control the probability measure. So this is the mathematical realization for the basic framework. And we can we can use a rigorous manifold definition from um, different geometry. So M is a topological space, but covered by set open size. And then each open set uh, U alpha can be mapped by homeomorphism phi alpha, okay, to the Euclidean space. So the, the pair U alpha phi alpha form a chart. Okay, phi alpha is an encoding map. Okay. Um, <clears throat> then for the same point, we can cover by different local charts. So the transition give you the mapping from one local feature to another local feature representation. And this one changed the probability distribution. So here we can visualize a simple example. Uh, suppose the ambient space is a three-dimensional Euclidean space, R3. Then the, the data manifold sigma is a 2D surface, is the hybrid Buddha. Okay. Then the Buddha surface is curved, okay, embedded in R3, but the dimension for this Buddha surface is only two. Okay. Then the encoding map, map from a uh, three dimensional ambient space to the 2D plane, and the map that the uh, manifold to a 2D disk. So this shows the encoding precise. But uh, the encoding map is not unique. So for the same Buddha surface, we can map to, uh, to uh, either on the left or on the right, different uh, mapping to the feature space. So this mapping will change the distribution, okay? So here we show the first encoding map. So if we example uniformly, okay, on the, on the latent space, then we pull back, okay, this uniform distribution to the original surface, we see the distribution on the Buddha surface is not unique, uh, it's not uniform. So some part, like the head part, is really sparse. The body part is denser. Okay. So if we use the second encoding map, if we put uniform distribution okay, on the latent space, then we, we get uniform distribution on the data manifold. 
So compare those two encoding map, we can see that by changing the encoding map, okay, then basically we can control okay, the, the probability distribution. And uh, in reality, so basically suppose we, we try to uh, using GAN model to generate human facial surface, uh, human facial image. Then uh, so each facial image is determined by a finite number of genes and the lighting conditions and camera parameters. So therefore, uh, all the facial images form a manifold in the image space. Then uh, so, uh, the GAN can learn this manifold, okay, and represent decoding map explicitly or implicitly. Then uh, we can uh, we can transform a white noise in the latent space okay, <clears throat> to an image on the data manifold, namely a facial image. Okay. Then uh, using this point of view, uh, we can explain a lot of machine learning tasks. So for example, if we want to do the noise, um, <clears throat> then uh, basically we use a clean images to train a manifold sigma. Then uh, given a noisy image P tilt, we can find the closest point on the manifold to P tilt. <clears throat> okay. Then uh, using geometric projection, we map P tilt to P. Then P is a clean image closest to the given noisy image. Then P is the denoise result for um, P tilt. So therefore, we can explain um, denoising as a geometric projection using a machine learning framework. So for example, here we show um, <clears throat> given some kind of uh, noisy human facial photo, then we project to the clean uh, facial photo manifold then uh, the closest part give you the denoise result, okay? But if we change the underlying manifold, um, <clears throat> okay, to, to, the, to the manifold or cat face, then we see that the projection doesn't make sense. So therefore, we see the key difference between machine learning denoising method and the classical denoising method. So using traditional method, basically we, we can do Fourier transform then we filter out the high frequency, the inverse Fourier transform back to the denoise image. But for the machine learning, uh, we use a clean uh, data to train a clean manifold, then do projection. So therefore, the traditional method uh, is independent of the content of the image. But the machine learning method heavily depends on the content of the image. So the prior knowledge is encoded by the, by, by the manifold. So this is the key difference between the data-driven and then information um, theory method, okay? Then how can we learn the structure for manifold? So there are many, many ways, okay, in machine learning. Um, basically, um, GAN can learn the manifold structure from data, then it represent the manifold uh, implicitly or explicitly using encoding map or decoding map, so which are represented by neural network, okay? <clears throat> so it's well known that uh, the autoencoder can learn encoding map, also decoding map. So here we see this one autoencoder. We have symmetric uh, networks. Then in the bottom, okay, in the um, uh, in the middle, we have a okay the latent code layer. This determine the dimension for the latent space. Then the input actually is a raw image. The output is another image. Then we compare the difference between the input and the output using a different. Um, energy like L2 energy, then try the parameter for the for the neural network. So the first part of the neural network is the encoder. Uh, okay, the second part is the decoder. The bottleneck will give you okay the latent space. Then we can <clears throat> uh, use this model, okay, really to do some kind of manifold embedding. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in practice, people are using a ReLU DN. So for ReLU DN, actually, um, we can show that, okay, that the function can be treated as a composition for um, linear mapping and also ReLU function. So eventually, okay, the mapping is a piecewise linear function, okay? Then uh, we, we can really see each piece, okay, in the following way. So basically, um, we fix encoding map, okay? Then uh, given each data point, each example, we can see the activated paths, okay? Basically, which is the path for all the activated neurons, okay, in the network. Then uh, for each data example, we have a, a activated path, okay? 
And uh, for two examples, if they share the same activity path, we say they are equivalent. And we can classify all the points okay, in the ambient space. And this form a cell decomposition for the whole uh, input space. Basically, two points in the ambient space, if they share the same activity path, we say they are equivalent. Then uh, this equivalence class okay, uh, form, a, form a cell. The whole space can be decomposed as, a, as this cell decomposition. So here we show, okay, one real example <clears throat> to explain this idea. So suppose, okay, the input is a point on a 2D manifold. The ambient space is a R3, and using autoencoder, we can encode this manifold to the 2D latent space. Okay, so this is the computational result. So this is the uh, input manifold. Okay, so this is the feature space. Okay, the image on a feature space. Then this is a reconstructed okay, manifold using the decoding map. Then we see that the decoding manifold, okay, reflects the original structure uh, very faithfully, okay? Okay, then using, okay, the cell decomposition, we, we defined, we can see, okay, the cell structure for the input space, the latent space, okay, and the output space. So basically, uh, each color cell representing one equivalent class. Then we see that the ReLU DNN basically partition the whole space to many, many pieces. And uh, on each piece, the mapping is a linear. So therefore, the whole mapping is a piecewise linear, okay, uh, from the ambient space to the latent space and comes back, okay, to the ambient space. So therefore, the learning capability for neural network can be represented by, by the pieces of all this kind of uh, encoding map and the decoding map. So <clears throat> then we can use uh, this number, okay, as the complexity for the ReLU DNN. So this complexity actually reflects the learning capability for the deep learning neural network, okay? And actually we can really calculate uh, this complexity mathematically using a simple computational geometry method, okay? So we, we can estimate the upper bound, okay, for this one. So therefore we can quantitatively measure the learning capability. But on the other hand, okay, we can define something called a complexity for the manifold. So this means that uh, we need to partition the manifold to many pieces, such that each piece can be linearly mapped to, uh, to the uh, latent space. So the minimum number of, of this kind of piece is called the complexity of the manifold. So the complexity of the manifold okay, reflects the difficulty to learn this manifold. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, we see that uh, very naturally, we can develop the encoding condition. So a manifold can be learned by a network if and only if the complexity for the manifold is less than the complexity uh, of the neural network. So then we can, <clears throat> so given the arbitrary uh, ReLU DNN neural network, we can easily find a special manifold. So um, <clears throat> the neural network cannot learn this manifold, okay? So this is not a surprise, okay? Basically, we, we can quantify the learning capability and the learning difficulty, okay? <clears throat> Uh, then the second question is uh, how how can deep learning control the probability distribution? Okay, so basically we know that for for the GAN model, we convert white noise basically is a Gaussian noise or uniform distribution in the latent space, okay, to a distribution, okay, uh, on the data manifold or the data distribution. So how can we convert from one probability distribution to another one? So this is another major task for deep learning. Then uh, uh, this is again our view. We have a discriminator, we have a generator. The input to the generator is white noise. Okay, then uh, the generator convert the white noise to a generated uh, sample. So the discriminator okay, accept the data sample and the generated sample and uh, compare them. Okay, <clears throat> then uh, by the competition between discriminator and the generator, we can improve the capabilities on both sides until they reach a uh, Nash equilibrium, then we can get a very good uh, generative model. And as, as explained um, <clears throat> by Goodfellow, so basically you know, we have two neural network. One is the generator, one is the discriminator. Then uh, the generator basically convert uh, a Gaussian distribution in the latent space okay, to this uh, <clears throat> generated distribution green curve. Okay, then the, the discriminator compare the green curve with this dotted curve. Dotted curve representing the data distribution. 
Okay, so this connector compute the distance between two distributions. The generator convert from one distribution to another one. So this is the mathematical uh, discretion for generator and the <coughs> discriminator. Okay, then uh, using our model, <coughs> we can we can see this way. Basically, um, <coughs> Z is the latent space. So in the latent space, we have a uniform distribution or Gaussian distribution. Then the G theta is the generator. Then we convert okay to the white noise from latent space okay to a generated distribution okay, in the ambient space okay on the, uh, on the manifold mu theta. Then uh, the real data distribution is new. Okay, the discriminator compute distance between mu theta and and new. Okay, so discriminator compute the distance between two two distributions. The generator compute transformation from one simple distribution okay to the to mu theta. Okay. Uh, then here um, we can introduce the concept for uh, optimal transportation. So basically, we can define vast extent space. So given a remaining manifold, then we consider all possible probability distributions on this manifold. Then uh, um, <clears throat> all such kind of distributions form an infinity, infinite dimensional manifold, which is called vast extent space. Then uh, in this space, we can define the distance between two arbitrary uh, points, basically two distributions, which is called Watson distance. Then uh, the Watson distance is given by something called optimal mass transportation. So basically, given two probability distributions, mu and the new, then uh, there is a unique transportation map, T, mapping the manifold to itself. Then uh, <clears throat> this mapping map mu to new with a minimal transportation cost. Then this transportation cost actually is defined as what's the distance. Okay, <clears throat> then we can make everything rigorous. Um, <clears throat> consider uh, given two bounded domains in Euclidean space, then there are two distributions, mu and nu. Uh, then we say a mapping T is a matter preserving. So if this T maps uh, mu to nu, so namely given any of the big measurable set B on a target, then uh, the, the new measure for, for this B equal to the mu measure of the pre-image of B, okay? So this equation holds for arbitrary B. In this case, we say, okay, uh, the mapping push forward mu to new, okay? So if this mapping um, is smooth, then we can deduce okay, the so-called Jacobi equation for this for this one. So the determinant for, for the okay, Jacobi matrix equal to the density ratio. Um, then if given a transportation cost, Cxy, meaning the cost for moving uh, unit mass from point x to y, then we can define the transportation cost for the, for the whole map. So basically, for each point, we measure the cost to the target point, multiply the density, we do integration, okay? So this gives you the total cost for the for a map. And um, <clears throat> the mange basically, is the question for uh, optimal transportation problem. Basically, suppose we given a uh, mu and a new, how can we find a transportation map, okay, which push forward mu to new with a minimal total cost? So this problem is called a Munch problem. Then uh, the Watson distance actually is given by this minimal cost, okay? So this question is pretty uh, um, complicated. Then uh, Kantar Rowich saw this question in 1970s. Then uh, he won Nobel Prize in economics. So basically, he relaxed okay on the probability measure to be joint distribution, okay, whose marginal distribution, whose marginal uh, probability measure equal to mu and the new. Then uh, we minimize okay this kind of transportation energy. Uh, then by some mathematical deduction, Kantar Rowich. Uh, original formulation can be converted to, to a simpler okay, formulation like, like the following. Okay, basically we can find the two function phi and the psi such that okay they satisfy this equation and we maximize this energy. Then if we do define something called a C transform, we can change the psi okay to the C transform of phi, then uh, the Kantar-Rowich dual problem become very simple. Okay, like the one shown here. And for most machine learning, 
uh, works based on vast thin distance, they use this kind of formulation. Then phi here is called a counter rowage potential. Um, <clears throat> but in 1980s, um, <clears throat> Brenier discovered another theory. So if the cost function is L2 distance, is the square for Euclidean distance. In this case, Brenier proved that um, the optimal translation map is given by convex function U. So the gradient of U gave us the mapping. Then this U is called the Brenier potential. So then the problem boils down, how can we find the Brenier potential such that the gradient give you uh, the optimal, optimal translation map? Um, <clears throat> then from Jacobi equation, we can get the necessary condition for Brenier potential, which is the classical motion pay equation, like the one shown here. Then the motion pay equation is highly nonlinear, and uh, solving this equation um, basically is really challenging. But uh, fundamentally, uh, finding okay the transformation map from one one distribution to another one, boil down solving this PDE. So this plays a central central role in the uh, um, optimal transformation theory. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, then from Brenier theory, we can get a, a very simple corollary. So basically, we see that the Brenier potential ux and the counter rowage potential phi x, they are related by this special equation. Okay. So uh, from previous analysis, we know that okay, the discriminator computing phi, the generator computing u, then this equation means that if we know the optimal solution, for discriminator, we can write down the solution to generator. Vice versa, if we know the optimal solution to the generator, we can write down okay, the solution to the okay, discriminator. So therefore, uh, the discriminator and the generator, they are closely related by this equation. So the competition actually is unnecessary. They should collaborate. If one knows the answer, then the other one can be written in this closed form. Okay. <clears throat> Then uh, the motion pay equation actually uh, can be explained using convex geometry. Has a very uh, simple geometric uh, <clears throat> setup. The light one shown here. Uh, suppose we are given a convex polytope. Then we know the normal to each face. Also, we know the area to each face. So in this case, Minkowski shows that we can determine the shape uniquely after translation. And later, um, his student. Okay, Alexandrov generalized this one for open convex polytope. So given, given a convex polytope, if we know the normal to each face, also we know the area of each face. Basically, we can determine the shape of this uh, convex poly polytope. The unique up to translation. Okay, <clears throat> then uh, the PDE behind the Alexandrov problem is exactly a uh, motion pay equation. So therefore, uh, this figure gives us the geometric understanding to the OT map, okay? So therefore, solving OT map is equivalent to solve this convex polytope. Uh, then in uh, 2013, we developed a theory finding a very rational approach to solve Alexandrov problem. Basically, everything boils down to uh, minimizing a convex energy, okay? By doing this, we can find uh, the optimal transmission map, okay? So everything has a very clear geometric understanding and a very rigorous PDE theory behind that. Okay. <clears throat> so then uh, in practice, we can use either uh, gradient descent to solve the problem, or we can use Newton's method to solve the problem. Okay. Then we come back to uh, to the GAN model. So in the GAN model, we know that the generator finding the mapping from white noise to the data distribution discriminator finding the vast stand distance between the generated distribution and the data distribution. Okay. And using counter rowage setup, okay, everything boils down um, this mean mass process. Okay. So the mass process basically calculating the counter rowage potential. Okay, the mean process calculating the, the generating function TCD here. Okay. Then in L1 case, uh, then the, the C transform of counter rowage potential equal to minus uh, counter row is potential, then everything can be read down in a very simple form. But in this case, uh, the counter row potential must be one Lipschitz. So therefore, the optimization is highly non-trivial. Then in L2 case, so basically, uh, based on Brenier uh, theory, we see that, okay, the Brenier potential should be calculated by generator. 
And the phi is the counter row each potential should be generated, uh, calculated by the discriminator. Then from this equation, we see that in theory, so the generator can be obtained from the optimal discriminator without training. Then D can be obtained from G without training. So therefore, the two deep neural networks are redundant. Okay, we can we can save at least one of them. Then the competition between D and G actually in theory is unnecessary. So basically, we can improve the training process to be more efficiently uh, to share the internal structure okay, for this problem instead of brute forcefully compete with each other. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in discrete case, uh, we know that all the examples are a discrete point. So the target probability measure uh, can be represented as a Dirac measure. And in this case, we can really calculate um, the brilliant potential using piecewise linear function, which can be represented by ReLU DAN using, uh, using CPU. Then uh, the computation boils down to some convex optimization process. Then this theory actually can be used to explain mode collapse uh, okay, very convincingly. So we know that so GANs are very difficult to train and uh, extremely sensitive to hyperparameters. Then the GAN suffer a lot from mode collapse. So basically, the generated distributions meet some modes. Okay. And uh, sometimes GAN may generate unrealistic examples. Okay. Some, some data samples between different modes, which are not very realistic. So this kind of phenomena um, can be um, <clears throat> summarized as something called the mode collapse. Okay. Then everything can be explained by the regularity theory for the solution to the motion pay equation. So here we, we, we just uh, briefly introduce that. So basically, um, <clears throat> suppose we're given a uh, um, <clears throat> two probability measure, then uh, if the support for the target measure, okay, um, <clears throat> is, a, is a convex, then uh, by, by the classical regularity theory, we know that, so if the density, okay, are smooth enough, then the solution is, uh, is smooth. The solution, is a uh, okay two order smoother okay than the than the density functions. So here we we need to assume the target support must be convex. But if the target support is not convex, then there must be some singularity. Okay. Um, so here we show some example. <clears throat> so suppose we try to find an optimal transmission map between okay uniform distribution in a square okay um, <clears throat> to uniform distribution. With a two hemi 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 dicks, okay. So this is the target. So the, the target domain is not convex; they are disjoint. Then uh, here we show the mapping. Then we see that in the middle, the mapping is not continuous. Okay. So the mapping itself is discontinuous along this line. Okay. So, so if the target is connected but it's non-convex, like dumbbell shape, like shown here, then uh, okay, the optimal transmission map from uniform distribution to here, actually it's a discontinuous along this gamma one and gamma two. We still have a dis disjoint, okay, discontinuity site. So this theory actually holds for arbitrary dimension. So here we show, okay, the uniform distribution within the solid ball to this solid bunny. So basically the density equal to one inside the bunny equal to zero outside the bunny. Then we found the optimum transmission map between the solid ball to this uh, uh, solid bunny. Then we see that the mapping has a foldings along the boundary. Okay, so therefore, for the interior, okay, the mapping is is smooth, but uh, but uh, the boundary actually is folded. There are a lot of foldings. Okay, then these foldings give us singularity site. Then uh, restricted on the singularity site, the mapping itself is discontinuous. Okay. So then this can be summarized, okay, in this theory. So basically, um, <clears throat> given uh, omega and gamma, which are two bounded open set, then we have a, okay, two probability measure, okay, defined on those two sites. Then we have a, um, <clears throat> the optimal transmission map, T, mapping from omega to gamma. Then uh, <clears throat> the theory claim that there exist two relatively close sites, okay, Sigma omega and sigma gamma. So the measure for these two singular sites equal to zero, but T is a homeomorphism, okay, on the complement side. But then uh, on this sigma omega, the mapping is discontinuous. Okay. 
So as one shown here, so uh, the source is uniform distribution on the uni disk. The target is a irregular shape. So the boundary is concave. Then uh, in the middle, there's some holes. So the mapping here, we show the mapping. So <clears throat> so each checker here is mapped to a, uh, to a small region here, which is the same color. Then we see that at this point, it literally is mapped to the whole region here. Okay. Then uh, <clears throat> uh, in this mapping, we see gamma 1, okay, gamma 2, gamma 3, which are three singular sites. Along those, okay, those curves, the mapping is not, not continuous. Okay. So, so here we can visualize okay, the mapping in a, in a more obvious way. So suppose the target are three cluster points. Okay, the source is the uniform distribution on the unit disk. Then here we calculate the Brignard potential. So the Brignard potential itself is a continuous, but with three ridges. Okay, so the projection of ridges actually give us the singular singular site. The mapping is continuous. Okay, uh, in general, but it is continuous along those those singular sites. So we see this part is mapping to this cluster. This mapping map to this cluster. This mapping to this cluster. Okay, so then we see that uh, for deep neural networks, they can only represent continuous mappings. Okay, but from theory, okay, the transportation maps are discontinuous on similar sites. So namely, the target mappings are outside the functional space or DNS. So therefore, we have this infinite. Uh, they we have this uh, intrinsic conflict. So basically, what we want is outside what we can represent. So therefore, this explains the mode collapse is unavoidable for the current for the current uh, GAN model. But then, uh, how can we avoid uh, mode collapse? How can we change the architecture to do that? So basically, we know from this picture showing here, we see that so the, the transportation map is a discontinuous, but the Brignard potential is continuous. So therefore, the DNN should model the potential function instead of model the mapping directly. So by doing this, then uh, we can really model okay <clears throat> the Brignard potential. Then we can we can find the optimal transition map. So this give us a theoretic interpretation for mode collapse, and also give us a practical solution to avoid mode collapse. Okay. <clears throat> so then, uh, how can we uh, verify our hypothesis that okay the transition map? We are we are talking at uh, not continuous. So here we show very simple example. Basically, we're using auto encoder to encode human facial images to the latent space. Then in the latent space, uh, we find an optimal transition map between uniform distribution uh, in the unit cube, okay, to the target distribution. And then uh, in the latent space, we pick arbitrary two points. So one is the boy's face. One is a girl's face. Then we draw a straight line segment between those two faces. Then we do linear interpolation in the latent space. When we map back, we can get a sequence of faces. Mm. Uh, transition from one face to the other one. But then this line cross some singularity point. Then at that point, mm. we encounter some point outside the data manifold. So which which is uh, some something here. So you can see that we generate some human facial photo. One eye is blue and the one eye is brown. So this kind of person is really un, un, is really rare, very unlikely to happen in, in reality. So this means that the mapping, okay, actually is a discontinuous at those points. So therefore we found some unrealistic uh, data samples using this method. So this gives us a validation for, for, for our hypothesis so that uh, the transformation mapping, okay, itself is discontinuous. Okay, <clears throat> uh, then uh, we can propose a novel okay, architecture to calculate, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the architecture is, uh, is shown here. So basically given the data manifold, <clears throat> then we can use an autoencoder to find manifold learning, computing the encoding map, decoding map. Then, uh, then on the latent, in the latent space, we're using uh, the optimal transportation method to calculate the transportation map from okay white noise okay to the data distribution. So the second part can use a conventional uh, geometric method or PDE method. 
uh, which is a transparent everything we know already. The first part we're using a, a autoencoder, a conventional deep learning method. So then this architecture make half of the black box uh, to be transparent. Then everything is controllable. So and also this this method can avoid mode collapse completely. Okay. So it has many uh, merits. Basically, uh, for solving motion pay equation can be reduced to a convex optimization which has a unique solution and it's pretty stable. Then uh, we can use a uh, uh, calculated Python matrix. We can use Newton's method for prob probability distribution step. Then uh, also uh, we can build a theory to control the approximation error for the second step. Um, <clears throat> then the whole thing can be um, <clears throat> implemented using GPU. So it is much faster and more stable uh, than the uh, class than an existing method. So here we just show some computational result. So um, we compare with uh, um, VAE WGAN, uh, different method generated this MNIS data set. So the, the last one is AE OMT. Okay, then we can generate human face. Then we can verify and also test okay, the mode, mode collapse. We can compare different um, criteria for the performance, like FID. Yeah, then we can do all the existing method. And comparing with the uh, existing method, so AE OMT framework gives us a uh, better performance. Okay. So then, uh, in conclusion, so basically, um, so this talk introduced a geometric understanding for deep learning. And the first, uh, we emphasize the manifold dis dis uh, distribution hypothesis. This gives us the intrinsic pattern for the natural data. Then the deep learning can discover this kind of pattern, so therefore become really effective. Then we see that based on this hypothesis, we see deep learning system has two major tasks. One is the manifold learning, one is the distribution transformation. So manifold learning means we compute encoding map, decoding map. Then for for the distribution um, transformation, we can use in conventional optimal translation method to do that. Then using Brainier theory, we see that the generator and the discriminator should collaborate with each other instead of compete with each other. Because optimal solution uh, to the generator can be written uh, using the optimal, uh, optimal solution to the discriminator, and vice and versa. Okay? So therefore, during the training, generator and discriminator should share intermediate computational result okay? instead of just uh, by competing each other. Uh, furthermore, we're using regularity theory of motion pay equation to explain mode collapse. Then we propose a EOT framework, so which can eliminate mode collapse and make the whole black box, okay, part of black box transparent. Okay, okay, that's it. Thank you.